Um, how can we be heard so long as we're nobody yet? Unknown, economically dependent, and supposed to get somewhere. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Well, first of all, nobody is nobody. And if you want to have, there are very good models as to what young people can do. Uh, they've achieved a great deal. So let's go back, uh, say, 50 years and go to uh, uh, North Carolina in the United States or a, a Georgia in the United States. At that point, uh, young people who were facing far harsher difficulties than you are, uh, young black kids, uh, decided to uh, uh, sit in on uh, restaurants to insist on being waited in restaurants, which was illegal for blacks at the time. So a small group of young kids, college students, uh, went and sat in at a, at a bar, in a, a diner. The police came, took them out, uh, you know, threw them in jail, I'm sure it wasn't very pleasant. The next day more came back and did it again. Uh, after a couple of years, it uh, ended up really revolutionizing the country. That's what, one of the things that sparked the civil rights movement. Uh, they, they, they were at a, a lot of them were at Spelman College, a black college. Uh, they had virtually no support from the faculty. Two faculty members supported them. Uh, uh, both were thrown out. <laughs> One was Howard Zinn, who you may know, my old friend who died two years ago. He was a faculty member. He supported the students. Uh, he was expelled. Uh, the uh, students themselves uh, went on. A lot of them became, uh, joined the group that became the Freedom Riders. At that point, white students, some white students from the North came down to join them. Uh, and. Uh, they rode in buses through the South trying to register blacks. Couldn't register then. Uh, they didn't, it wasn't easy. Several of them got murdered. Uh, others were beaten, uh, thrown into prisons. I was down there for demonstrations, and you could see, I mean, watching while uh, uh, state police were uh, uh, beating and people, kid, young kids mostly, driving them up the, they were fleeing to the steps of the federal building where the state police are not allowed to go. And the federal building was lined with federal marshals sent from Washington who were throwing them back into the streets. That's the way the government was protecting them. Uh, well, you know, they, had, they achieved a great deal. Uh, Martin Luther King, who was an extremely important person, would have been the first to tell you that he was riding the the groundswell that they developed. And that's by no means the only case. Uh, pick my own university at MIT. Uh, MIT and, uh, was uh, practically 100% funded by the Pentagon, uh, which uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe means it was extremely free. The Pentagon didn't care what you did. They wanted to create the economy of the future. Uh, that was their job. Uh, it's uh, highly undemocratic. They were using public resources on the, not they, the government, used public resources on the pretext of defense to develop uh, uh, computers, uh, the internet, uh, microelectronics, and so on. That's the way the high-tech economy developed. But it was a very passive place, very passive, acquiescent, uh, people doing their work, uh, not paying much attention to anything. There were about uh, five students uh, who decided to try to stir the place up. Uh, some of them you may know. One was Michael Albert, who now runs Zenet. Uh, uh, another was Steve Shalom, who's a uh, uh, couple of people or a couple others. And they just kind of began organizing groups around the campus. Uh, by 1968, they had so radicalized the campus that Mike Albert was elected student president on a platform so radical you can barely believe it. Well, he was thrown out, we had to get him back in, and usual things happened. 
Uh, but the point is that the university has never been the same to this day. Now it's an uh, active, uh, a lot of participation, totally different relationships among people, uh, and it's a center of activism. Uh, and the things like that happen all the time. There's a tremendous amount that young people can do. In fact, if you look at the, what takes say Tahrir Square in Cairo, uh, that was mostly organized by uh, fairly young people, I guess in their 20s mostly, uh, tech savvy, uh, began reaching out to others. Uh, they didn't really expect much at the beginning, uh, but they, within a couple of uh, weeks, they had uh, half of Egypt out there. And they overthrew a dictatorship. They got a long way to go, but uh, it was a major event, again, initiated by uh, young people who were committed and active. And there are plenty of other examples. Uh, uh, you can be heard, all right. Uh, in linguistics, you have wondered whether language is an optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is an optimal solution in politics as well? Or should we sometimes accept the least bad option? Well, if there is an optimal solution, I'm not smart enough to figure out what it is. There's just too much we don't know about human beings and about societies. Uh, a lot of will, would have to be learned by experimentation trying things, if they work, try other things, and so on. And in fact, this is a pretty traditional view on the left. So say, take uh, Karl Marx, you read through all of his works, you find practically nothing on post-capitalist society. A couple of sentences scattered around here and there. So in a post-capitalist society, you know, you, everyone would fish in the morning and grow his garden in the afternoon, a couple of lines like that. And there was a reason for it. Uh, he uh, believed in workers' democracy. His conception was that there would be a popular revolution, and uh, working people would take control of their own fate and their own institutions, and then they would work out what the society ought to be like. Uh, he didn't have a prescription. He had some ideas about general principles, but not a description. Uh, on the other hand, there are there were people on the left, still are. Uh, Mike Albert, who I mentioned, is one who think that you can give a very detailed account of what a future society ought to be like. And they've worked out you know, detailed proposals, which you could try out right now, even within the present society. Well, you know, between these two extremes, there are lots of uh, approaches that people have taken, and you have to decide how much you think you understand. Uh, I don't think I understand very much, so I don't feel uh, a more on Marxist side. I think these things will have to be worked out. Uh, I doubt that there's anything that you could call an optimal solution. That people are just too different. They live in too many different ways. There are probably many possible peaks that can be approached. And, uh, life will be a lot more interesting if, if this diversity in outcomes. <coughs>